Hello my friends, my name is Artur Rey and I am an Estonian YouTuber. US has over 600 foreign bases, military bases, that's what I'm talking about. The whole world has almost US troops, except for its enemies. US is the world's policeman. Before it, Britain was, now it's the US. It always seems strange to me that this is going on, because you guys, the Americans, are paying for it. You know, the taxpayers' money goes and funds all of this stuff. So, for me, it's always an anomaly. How can the government take this amount of money and just put it out into the world, not into its own citizens? But I am, again, a foreigner across the bond. I might not understand it, but today I will try. We will watch a video about US overseas military bases, because these are the most expensive ones, and maybe it will clear some things up for me. If you ask the US military how many bases they have overseas, you won't really get an answer. They don't make it all too hard to find out about the larger ones, Ramstein Air Base in Germany, Thule Air Base in Greenland, Camp Hansen in Japan. These all show up on the closest thing to an official catalog of the US military's real estate there is, the annual Department of Defense Base Structure Report. According to this document, the American military has some 514 sites outside of its borders, but there are some noticeable omissions to this list. For example, the US has a rather secretive drone base in central Niger, however, according to this list, it doesn't exist. The US has more than 10 sites in Syria, however, according to this list, they don't exist. The US has a satellite surveillance facility in Australia's Northern Territory so well known, in fact, that it has a whole fictional TV show based on it, but according to this list, it doesn't exist. Ooh, so much secrets! O officially, they don't exist, but they're super expensive. They might not exist, but they still swallow millions of dollars of money, taxpayers' money. So it, people have to be wondering. Maybe that's why all the time Europeans sometimes wonder why are all these conspiracy theories coming from America? Because Americans are rich, their uh, government, you, you got, your government can do stuff that other governments can't. They have that, mu that much money and influence. They can do things under that secrecy and maybe that leads to all of these conspiracy theories because I haven't heard much coming from Europe. Most of them come from America and also like Area 51, all, all of these military involved conspiracy theories. Government is pretty secretive where it uh, puts its funds. In fact, according to this list, there are just four Defense Department installations in Africa. A base in Djibouti, a joint British-American base on Ascension Island, an NSA site in Kenya, and a naval medical research facility in Egypt. Of course, if you dig a little deeper into the vast archive of unclassified military documents, you find this. A slide from a presentation clearly showing 34 US military sites in Africa. With omissions such as these, one can assume that the total 514 number is far from the real count of how many facilities the US military maintains abroad. Part of this could be attributed to the fact that it's sometimes tough to define what a military base is. Again, looking at the African continent, the only site that looks like what most would traditionally think of as an overseas military base is in Camp Le Monnier in Djibouti. It is the only permanent, exclusive US military site, at least according to their own definition, on the continent, hosts about 4,000 members of the US military at a time, and is the primary base of operations for the US Africa Command. 4,000 at a time, that's huge. That's bigger than the small town I lived in for the first, I don't know, 17 years of my life. And that's just all military personnel overseas, professional. And that's their profession to be there, to just be there and be trained there. Crazy. I mean, it's not a secret, no one wants to talk about this, but Estonia's active military duty personnel is about close to 10,000, pretty much, which is a ridiculously small number. And US has just uh, one base in Africa, 4,000, you know. If you compare the numbers, then, as an Estonian, these numbers are really hitting me in the face. Like, a, a country, I know how expensive it is to keep these soldiers there. It's expensive as hell. It's too, you, wouldn't want to know. And the government is doing it. All because it uh, widens their sphere of influence. I'm not blaming here, I'm just saying it's really clever actually. And really efficient. And US is the world's policeman. It has to do it, I guess. You see, the US military splits the world into six regions, each with their own infrastructure of bases. Each has a hierarchy of sites. The highest, in the case of Africa Command, are those permanent full-blown bases. The one in Djibouti and the one on Ascension Island. One step below that are what are called cooperative security locations. 
These are, according to the U.S. military's definition, host nation facilities with little or no permanent U.S. personnel presence, which may contain pre-positioned equipment and or logistical arrangements and serve both for security cooperation activities and contingency access. CSLs are useful to the U.S. military because they are much less flashy and less permanent. They don't require the same kind of political capital as to set up a full-size base like the one in Djibouti. Bases are often unpopular and receive press scrutiny, both in the U.S. and the host country, so small, few-hundred-person CSLs have the advantage of being able to be set up with, essentially, no publicity. Yeah, you can still set up a few hundred uh, personnel base that is actually fully operational and very highly defendable, but the press won't uh, blink an eye. But if you set up a base with built uh, housing and infrastructure, everybody gets mad. Oh, U.S. sphere of influence, they're military. But yeah, if you just put up a few tents, no one says anything. Although the men are the same inside the tents and inside the housing. They are fully trained American soldiers who are ready to do what they are ordered. You know, it's still a military presence and a very strong one. These small few hundred personal bases, they're not actually small. They're quite, quite capable. So it's, it's quite weird that the press is, is so against the bases and not against the, uh, the smaller ones. I wouldn't be against the US military base in Estonia. I mean, we are allies and it's much... For Estonians, we have two choices. Ally with Russia or ally with US. Of course, we picked US. So, and they have been good to us. Why not have a base in Estonia? I don't think Trump wants it. It's too expensive, but you know, send us some tanks at least. You can think of them as smaller versions of the kind of bases you find in Djibouti or Ascension Island, which can rather quickly become bigger bases should the need arise. The remaining 20 known sites on the continent are what are called contingency locations. Now, this terminology can be used for a lot of different types of facilities, but in essence, what it means is that these are temporary sites established as part of ongoing missions. For example, the contingency location in Garua, Cameroon was set up for the Americans to provide logistics and intelligence support in the Cameroonians' fight against Boko Haram. What that actually means, though, when you break through the military's PR language, is that this is a drone base. Unlike other American drone bases, it's relatively easy to find out about the one in Garua, perhaps because it's primarily- It's so strange. You think about drones, you think about these, like Mavic Air or something like that. I have a Mavic drone. It's nice, you can take aerial shots. Oh, a drone, a small, something small, that, a military drone, something small that flies and bombs. But if you look at this plane, it's damn huge. It's many, many times bigger than a human being, but it's unmanned. It's a drone and it's expensive as hell. And if US loses one of them, it's, it's such, a, such a chaos because it's, it's so expensive and it's a smart, intelligent thing. I wouldn't really think about how big it really is if I think about the word drone. Maybe like a flying robot would give me a better idea, but if I think about drone, a military drone, then this is not what comes to mind. This is huge. ...home to surveillance drones rather than strike drones. For other contingency locations, though, it is much less clear what exactly their purposes are, and for some, they aren't even publicly acknowledged. For many, the US military just has small agreements with foreign governments, and the general public gets very little info at all. So the final real answer for how many US bases there are abroad is that we don't know. If you define every military installation as a base, compiling all publicly available information, one set of research reached a number of 800. Of oh. course, the real number could be something far different from that, but as the general public, there's just no real way to know. But the next question that arises about the US's overseas presence is why. In the era of nuclear- Yeah, why? This is a very big question. And some of you have commented already why. Because after Second World War, somebody had to take over the role of being the world's policeman. Somebody has to make sure the world doesn't fall to chaos. Well, before that it has been Britain, it has been Spain. 2,500 years ago it was Rome. All of the known Western world was controlled by Rome and they were the policemen who played with politics and had bases in Germania and in uh, Middle East. Now it's U US and it's, it, they are quite similar in a way. So it's just a role to fill. Somebody has to fill it right now. It's the US. If you, if you follow me, if I, I see things that way. So it's just, it has, there has always been a world's policeman and now it's the US. Their weapons that can obliterate any city on earth in an hour, aircraft carriers sailing worldwide with more aircraft than some countries' air forces, and airplanes that could land troops in any country on earth in a day, why does the U.S. bother spending so much money maintaining bases in allied countries during peacetime? 
The primary reason has to do with a military concept known as the loss of strength gradient. This concept essentially theorizes that the further a conflict is away from a military's home country, the less military power that nation is able to bring to the fight. This is largely because it is, of course, complicated and expensive to bring troops and equipment over long distances. The book that originally defined- So the reason, the reason number one I heard here is because they want to be ready for war. If something happens, they are close by and they're ready. But why do they need to have, why do they have to be ready? The question is why did the US and its government take the responsibility for the whole world? It's fine, I like it, because I don't want to be under Russia, you know, we don't want to be under Soviet Union. I'm glad that the US has taken on this role, but why? What's the motivation behind it? That's what everybody's asking. This loss of strength gradient proposed that the way to counteract this effect was to establish bases outside of a country's home territory, since these can help reduce the effective distances to conflict, and, therefore, it's easier to bring more power to the fight. The US has certainly taken this concept to heart and has put quite a lot of work into trying to flatten out their loss of strength gradient. That is to say, they want to make sure it is just as likely that the US would win a war in East Asia as North America. As an example of how these bases aid that mission, much of the operations of the US's wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were conducted here, at Ramstein Air Base in Germany. This base and the other surrounding US military facilities in the Rhineland Palatinate state make up the largest grouping of American service members in the world and one of the largest groupings of Americans anywhere outside the US. The city that Ramstein and many of the other facilities are in is home to only about 100,000 full-time residents. However, the American bases are staffed by more than 50,000 personnel at any given time. 50,000 at any given time in peacetime, one base, that is a huge base. Whoa. What's the, yeah, what's the, what's the point of this? This is West Germany. I guess that's, Rammstein Air Base is uh, responsible for the whole Europe, I guess, because if they even wage war in Syria and they're in Germany, they can do it all, all over Europe. I'm quite sure also everything that comes to Estonia from the US goes through Rammstein, I think, because that's on the way and that's how the logistics works, but it's, Hearing these numbers still mind blows me. It's as a small country, it's how powerful they really are, how powerful, how much money they have to do this at, in peacetime. Imagine if war happens, these bases would triple or quadruple their uh, personnel, right? All right, talking about numbers, my friends, now is a good time to jump into the Estonian YouTuber Cup. Today we have some new countries, not just US, but yeah, new countries, and Finland might be losing the lead. You know, there's another one coming and taking over the lead. And let me tell you, it's also a winter country, so there's, there's some ski battles going on there. Welcome back, my friends, to the Hall of Fame. This is the Estonian YouTuber Cup competition. This is the cup. That's the boards. Everything you have gotten is represented here. We have a few countries also. And bear in mind the countries. They will come and play today. We have Mr. Mario Ruiz Paredes. Very much a Mexican, Hispanic name. Mario Ruiz Paredes, as Americans would say. But you are from San Jose or San Jose. I don't, I don't think even Americans call it Jose. It's San Jose, right? California. We have Robert. J. Morris. J, I don't know, for Jacob, for Jake. I have no idea what the J stands for. You're from Kelowna. Can you guess where Kelowna is? It's in Canada. Yes, we have a Nordic country. And right now, Finland and Canada are both in a tie, three versus three. Both winter countries, you can ski in both of them. They're both really nice and reserved. I like it. We have Gregory Latta. I'm saying it as an Estonian because this name is very pronounceable in Estonian. Gregory Latta in American, I guess. Mr. Latta, you're from London. No, not the UK. We have UK, yes, it has one point, but London, Canada. Yes, another one for Canada, which makes Canada number one in the countries list. You Canadians, you can be proud about your Nordic heritage and Finnish people. You gotta step up your pace a little bit. And Estonians, for Christ's sake, get to work. We have Mr. Kong Yu. Kong Yu. Hmm, that sounds Asian, I gotta say that. And the name where he's from, the city, Talafofa. What? Sounds like a Disney magic word, Talafofa. Because it is, it's from Guam. 
And we recently learned, I think, that Guam is not a state, is it? It's like a destructive area or a special area or something? Guam? Well, I don't care. Uh, it's a very special place because it's quite rare to get an order from there, so I'm going to add it anyway, Mr. Guam. Oh baby, we're running out of space. Adding that Guam, now we have one more slot, so faster states and territories will get their place on the Hall of Fame. We have Derek McClung. McClung, you're Scottish. How do the Scottish people say Mac? Is it Mac? Mick? I heard it's like E and A, uh, e and A something in between that Mick. McClung, you're from Mason, Michigan. While we are here, also, I like this setup, I will also take this chance to thank a Patreon. We have one new Patreon this time, not three, because it is a tough time, I understand. His name is Alexander Bosserman. Alexander Bosserman in Estonian, but you don't, you don't really hear that name, Bosserman, in Estonian. Alexander, yes, in the Russian communities. Thank you for becoming a Patreon. Back to the video. Yeah, Canada 4, Finland 3. Finland, you want to do something about it, you got to get some two more cups to get five. This makes Ramstein Air Base like a small American city in Europe. It has outposts of plenty of American restaurant chains that you won't find anywhere else in Germany, Johnny Ronkets, Chili's, P.F. Chang's, in addition to an American-style department and grocery store. It has an American post office, an American high school, baseball diamonds, two American football fields, American suburban-style housing, and even campuses of four American universities. University of Maryland, Oklahoma, Central Texas College, and Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Quite a lot of work is put into making sure that Ramstein is as similar to any base in the US as possible. So you live in Germany, but you kind of live in the US. All of these fast food chains and everything, you don't get them anywhere else. Also you have universities there, football fields. They're just building smaller areas of America on other soils. It's genius and weird and frightening at the same time. I don't know what to say. Both in terms of lifestyle and capability. <clears throat> One central role for Ramstein and other US bases in Europe during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan was as a stopover point for personnel and cargo en route to combat. Yeah. Ramstein's convenient location, less than a seven hour flight from all of the Middle East, where many of the US's recent military operations have been, makes it a pivotal logistics hub since it would be far more complicated to fly personnel and cargo nonstop to theater over the more than 11 hour flight from the continental US to the Middle East. Still today, with less US presence in the Middle East, Ramstein plays a central role in getting US military members to Europe. There are regular flights, typically about twice a week, from Baltimore to Ramstein, in addition to a number of regular flights from stateside military bases like Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, Dover Air Force Base in Delaware, and McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey. These are not flights on commercial airlines, but rather charter flights available only to members of the military operated by charter companies like Atlas Air and Omni Air International. Beyond its role as a logistics hub, Ramstein's geographic position plays a critical role in the US's use of drones in the Middle East. You see, American drones are communicated with by satellite, but due to the distance between the Middle East and Creech Air Force Base in Nevada, where the communications from the different drone piloting sites across the US are centralized, a single satellite could not convey information from Creech to the Middle East. That's just because there's too much curvature in the Earth for a satellite at a reasonable orbit altitude to have a line of sight with both areas. Oh. They could have one satellite relay info to another, but this would significantly increase the time it would take for the signal to travel from Creech to the drone, and when piloting and attacking remotely, one needs as close to real time. Watching this video, you would think we were talking about the whole human race being this evolved and doing these kind of operations, but it's still, you, you kind of tend to forget that this is just one country. It's just one single country. There's many countries in the world. It's just one. Their reach is global, and even outside, it's space, spacious, because we're talking about satellites, we're talking about Star Wars here, like in the 80s, right? So. It blows my mind, it's weird, it's weird watching this. You get a scale of how small you are and how big these politics are. Time communications as possible. Therefore, the signals travel by fiber optic transatlantic cable from the US to Ramstein, where a relay station- There's a fiber optic under the ocean? No way, how is this possible? Under the ocean, fiber optics. Wait, if somebody knows anything about this, explain this to me. The, the ocean is vast and immeasurably big and deep, and how, how can you just put a fiber optics on the bottom of that? It's just not going through the water, right? It's in the bottom, right? How, like, how much work has that takes? 
if there's a uh, underwater volcanic eruption, everything is screwed, right? I have a million questions. Then sends the signal up to a satellite based over the area that can communicate with America's drones in the Middle East. Without Ramstein, these drones would not be nearly as capable. Beyond convenience and capability, another major reason for America's heavy overseas military presence is power projection. This is a term used by militaries that refers to, according to the US Department of Defense's definition, the ability of a nation to apply all or some of its elements of national power. In this context, it's essentially how fast a country can get to the fight if a fight should arise. Power projection is as much an offensive power as a defensive one. It's about making sure that every other country in the world knows that America can and potentially will respond to whatever they decide is a threat in a timely manner. According to the US Department- So it is a show. I knew, yes, of course it's a show, but it's a real thing, but it's also for a show because the biggest winner in a conflict is the one who can prevent the conflict, right? And the US can prevent a lot of conflicts by just being there because any, no other country wants to be aggressor. And I'm talking about Russia here in the case of Estonia. Like, we are truly happy that the US has personnel in our country because Putin is thinking twice about coming here now, which puts my heart at ease. So I have to thank a lot of people for their service right now. Department of Defense, the four countries that currently present the greatest potential national threat to the US are Iran, Russia, China, and North Korea. Looking at the global map of bases, it's no coincidence that the greatest concentrations of overseas bases are near Russia's population center in the East, in the Middle East, and in East Asia. Meanwhile, there's relatively little US military presence in South America, Africa, South and Southeastern Asia, and Australia, since there are fewer threats to the US in these areas. Still though, the US military- There's a pattern here. All of the US enemies are or have been a communist state, so it all goes back to the Cold War, capitalism versus communism, and till nowadays even the countries, if they're not anymore run by Marxist ideology, they're still enemies of the US. And I wish they would just crumble. I don't want, to, they're evil, they're just pure evil. I know US has done some bad things also, but you don't compare them. You don't compare them to communist uh, monstrosities. And I don't like suffering, I don't like violence, so I'm just against all of it. And I would like it to just be removed from Earth. It has a nearly permanent presence on every continent. Even on Antarctica, where by international treaty militarization is banned, the US military skirts this regulation by dealing with the logistics of supplying American research bases, which is allowed by the treaty. Some might characterize this experience with Antarctic operations as convenient in the event of any future conflict in this region. While the US's network of overseas bases is only a part of its overall power projection mission, which also includes its nuclear weapons, aircraft carriers, submarines, and more, the main messaging they convey is that the US can get to anywhere fast. But predictably, these bases are controversial, both at home in the US and abroad. As one example, this is the island of Okinawa, Japan, and this is the land used by the US military. On this dense island of 1.5 million, 26,000 US service members man these sites. 26,000 and that much land, they take this is like almost one fifth of the land. Okay, this would make me mad. Of course, we're allies and everything, but it would make me very mad. But I, I know it's good for Japan. It's very good for Japan, especially with North Korea going crazy as it is. But still, I can already see how much tension there can be on Okinawans and Americans. While the Japanese government is supportive of the US presence in Okinawa and elsewhere in Japan, locally, there have been decades of tensions between the Okinawans and the US military. Mm -hmm. The US bases there have been an economic, social, and environmental burden on the island as, while the US military's presence in Japan as a whole is viewed largely as a benefit for the country, Okinawans are the ones that have to put up with having a large proportion of their home under the control of a foreign military. Okinawans reportedly feel like they've been ignored by mainland Japan and they've therefore been protesting, particularly against a forthcoming base move to a new site on the island, for years. This is the story for pretty much every country that hosts US military bases. They're often considered by foreign governments as a benefit to the country as a whole since it gives them an essence of protection by perhaps the most powerful military in the world, but it comes at a burden to the communities that bases are physically located in. In Okinawa, while the bases do provide a decent amount of employment for locals, it's now thought that the island could be better off economically with the land that these bases take up being used for commercial purposes. 
Back in the US, some believe that their tax dollars are being used to defend other countries. Yeah, that's the thing right now. I've heard even Trump talk about this, but we don't have to pay for them. Trump doesn't want the US to be the world's policeman anymore. He doesn't want to pay for it, but it's not his decision to make. I don't think it is. He's not a man up to that job. I think the next president or the previous one should have made that decision, but not him. He's talking about this as this is a light matter. Oh, we just pull out the troops. He doesn't know how much suffering and danger that might endure and how much work it might have to mean for US in the future if they want to come back. It might make it impossible if the enemies, you know, the evil people will take it over. I have no problem calling them that. So I do hope Trump's administration ends before he can pull out any troops from Estonia, you know. Some consider these overseas bases antiquated in the era of international military alliances like NATO, extensive aviation infrastructure that can get US forces anywhere on Earth in a matter of hours, and the deterrent threat of nuclear weapons. Meanwhile, others would argue that they are crucial assets to US diplomacy and power projection. They would argue that their very existence maintains the US's superpower status. This is all to say, simply, that the US military's worldwide presence is controversial, but likely effective. They certainly do make the US military seem more formidable in the international eye, which many Americans would consider a positive, but the final grand question is, at what cost? With the cost in dollars, the cost in geopolitical tensions, the cost in community detriment, the simple cost in how the world views the United States as a country, is it worth it? Yeah, that's a very big question, especially yesterday I read the title in Estonian news that US uh, raw oil for barrel has dropped under zero. That means it's free. The oil is free because no one is consuming it. There's no consumption because we have the big thing going around around the world right now. Everybody's infected. No one is working. No one is driving their cars. No boats, no planes. So no one is using oil. It's free and US government, US economy is truly greatly based on oil, not as much as Russia, of course, Russians are screwed right now, but the US still, if it's below zero, which it has never been before, how much does it cost you? How, how bad is it for you? What, what does it mean? Because if, if it's bad for the US, it's obviously bad for Europe, through US, so that's what I'm, why I'm asking. Maybe this reaches Estonia also at some point. We are already having a, a truly economic crisis here, and I don't, I don't want it to get worse. This video raised a lot of questions, a lot, and I know you can't answer all of them in the comments because I wouldn't have, it, it's impossible to read, because you guys sometimes answer really thoroughly, the comment is really long and I, I try to read as much as I can, but I can't read everything, so if there's, the better way is if there's an answer to my questions in a form of a fun video to watch, send it to me through Patreon or, and I will watch it. My friends, thank you for watching, it's truly interesting to me seeing how this politics unravels uh, through the world, it's, I like this stuff. Until the next video, go and get yourself an Estonian YouTuber Cup. Put your state on the Hall of Fame. You guys have been doing marvelously on this and just truly a great audience. I'm very thankful. And as always, until my next video, stay cool and bye-bye.